Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's uh, webinar is Treatment Options for Carriage Primary Teeth by Dr. David Wasserman. And just a couple of uh, house rules here. If you have any questions, please either hold them to the end or send them through the chat link. We will have a question and answer session at the end. And uh, where every question is, has been posted will uh, be answered. So please go ahead and uh, do that. And I will police the room and make sure that there's no audio um, and mute people. So without further ado, Dr. David Austin, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm not sure you can hear me. I hope you can. If you can't, please let Victor know. Um, thank you for spending some time with me tonight, 5.30. Um, Pacific Standard Time, so I'm sure most of you are thinking it's time for dinner. I'm going to try to go as quickly as I can, get you out probably in an hour, put your seatbelts on, we have a lot to talk about. And tonight's topic is can you really save that and why would you? Treatment options for carious primary teeth. I'm a pediatric dentist and I get the question all the time, why don't you just take that tooth out? Well, hopefully by the end of tonight you'll know why we don't we'll know how to save them, and we'll know what to do if you don't save them, how to make some space maintainers. So we're going to work really quickly, and let's see how far we can get. So let's advance that, and it's not advancing. Go ahead and click on it once, and you can advance. Pardon me? Uh, click on the slideshow once. Click on the slideshow, oh, OK. Like that, there we go. Anyway, greetings from San Francisco. Um, most of you know the, and you can see my pointer, the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, this is a fun run if you've ever done it. And this is something many of you may never see, but hopefully one day you will. It's three World Series trophies. Um, I obviously had nothing to do with getting them, but there they are. And it looks like this year the Dodgers are going to beat us. Oh, well. So. Do you really have to do that, or aren't they going to fall out anyway? One of the 10 killer questions that parents will always ask. So when you answer this and your staff answers, of course, yes, they do fall out. And what you should say is there's an infection in the tooth that must be cured. And baby teeth are important for eating, for maintaining space in the mouth, for being able to speak correct phonation, and especially growth and development of the faces and arches. If you remember, the alveolar bone exists only because the tooth is there. The alveolar bone is not the same as the um, intramembranous or endochondral bones that form in the face. It is a bone that forms specifically from the cementum of the teeth held to the teeth by the corpse, corpse fibers. So if you lose a tooth, you lose the alveolar bone. The only reason orthodontists can make any money in this world is because the teeth are in alveolar bone, which is extremely pliable, heals well, heals quickly, goes through microfractures, and restores itself. And it only does that if there's constant stimulation by teeth. You all know if you treat adults that when you lose a, an adult tooth, the alveolar bone totally disappears. And that, again, is because the alveolar bone is an extension of the cementum. Now, all of you remember what those pictures used to look like on the right? It looks like jaws. But that was a pretty standard thing to do, put every tooth in a stainless steel crown. Hopefully, by the end of tonight, you'll realize we don't have to do that. So let's quickly go into restoring primary teeth. This lower slide, I just put the I put these on just to show you something that we'll revisit in a minute. But these are fully restored front teeth. These were restored using um, strip crowns, and actually this tooth was restored using a strip crown. Um, this happened to have been a I'm going to say this a high placed official in the state of California's child who had a mouthful of decay. Um, he's pro fluoride, pro everything. Um, but the only problem is someone forgot to brush his kid's teeth and tell her not to eat, drink juice, and eat lots of candy. So this, they wanted nothing silver in the mouth. They didn't want anything with a core. And because so much space had been lost, I had no option but to do a composite crown in the back. So tell me what you think of that. Anyway, when you have caries and primary teeth, you used to think you had a kind of a digital option, a plus minus. Either you saved the tooth or you extracted the tooth. Hopefully, this little chart will show you that you have so many things. If you have decay into enamel, which is on the right-hand side, you're going to see 
you can have your choice of chemotherapy, and we'll go through those. And if it's into dentin and there's no pulp involvement, we have a resting the caries, or we can restore the caries. And if we rest the caries with silver diamine fluoride, eventually we go back to restore the caries. So this is something which is kind of interesting. And if there's pulpal involvement, so many of you were taught over and over and over again that you need to put a stainless steel crown on that tooth because the tooth dries out. You know what? That is one of the biggest old wives' tales ever, ever promulgated, that and teething. This is not a talk about teething, but teething doesn't exist either. But anyway, teeth don't break down because you've, you've dried the tooth out. What's happened is when you open the occlusal surface, you actually remove the cross-structural elements, the buccal, lingual, mesial, distal cross-structural element that keeps the tooth together. But if you could restore that strength using something bonded, such as a glass ionomer, which is a chemical bond, and a composite, which is a mechanical bond, then you can restore the, the strength of the tooth. And therefore, you don't always need stainless steel crowns. And we'll talk a little bit about that also. So, move, and you'll see also here we talk a little bit about if you happen to have no option but extract the tooth, the difference between space maintenance and no space maintenance. When do you need it, when not? When do you need an ortho consult? So hopefully we'll touch on most of those things. So monitor decay is always the easiest of all. You don't have to go in and do everything, or you don't, can't do it now. You have a kid who's a little bit too young. You're not sure you can get in there without sedating or general anesthesia. Or the tooth is within six to nine months of exfoliating. Why don't you do something to save the tooth, stop the decay? So. Watchful waiting includes diet control. This isn't a talk on prevention, but you've got to remember that caries are not just because you throw sugar at a tooth. Where's sugar? Sugar's in carbohydrates. Sugar's in just about everything you eat. Something is high in carbs, four exposures to carbs a day more than doubles your chance of getting cavities. Greater than 60 grams of carbs a day more than doubles your chance of getting diabetes. Take that one home. The kid that scares me the most is the one that walks in the office carrying a tub of Cheerios and throws them and it just keeps sucking them down. That's the kid who we have trouble with. Now, can you hear me? Let me, I hear that I might be breaking up a little bit. Um, maybe if I spoke a little more slowly, let's see how that works. And I'll wait for a little text from Victor to let me know whether or not you can hear me better now. Um, anyway, you have your choice of diet control, watching what you eat and the frequency you eat, the use of fluorides, a varnish, a mouth rinse, or water. And tap water, by the way, which is fluoridated, has 0.7 parts per million, which happens to be one half the amount of fluoride in ocean water. Atraumatic restorative techniques, IRTs, ITRs, these are all a form of um, indirect pulp capping, where you leave a certain amount of decay in the tooth and you cover it over with something which might release fluoride like a glass ionomer, or place a karyostatic agent such as silver diamine fluoride. And what about old technology? Well, silver diamine fluoride happens to go back to at least a thousand years. Um, silver is a natural antibiotic and it kills the bacteria that cause tooth decay. So basically, if you apply a silver nitrate solution to a tooth, it should stop caries. Many of you notice that on the old caries, there's no recurrent decay if you used an amalgam filling. It's because the silver is a natural antibiotic. Silver diamine fluoride has been used for many years in Europe and in China. And basically, it's silver and fluoride mixed together. And studies have shown that it is almost twice as effective as just using a glass ionomer. The only problem with it was when you apply it to a lesion, number one, it doesn't restore the lesion, so you can still have a plaque trap and get recurrent caries. And number two, it is ugly. It is black and it is ugly. It leaves a black crust. So what you do is you, at the same time you're applying the silver diamine fluoride, you blow the tooth dry and you use a little, um, one of the little proxy brushes, you paint the proxy brush on the lesion, blow it dry, and then you take glass ionomer and just rub or smear just a little bit of glass ionomer over it to cover the color. Now, one thing about glass ionomers, 
I know if you're using a light cured one, they're a mixture, they're a resin modified glass ionomer, but a regular glass ionomer also benefi benefits from the use of a light. In case you didn't know that, if you use a high intensity 1200 lumen night light, that will actually heat up and the heating will set the glass ionomer more quickly. So even though you're not getting the direct polymerization effect that you get when you have an RMGI, if you have a glass ionomer, use a little light to heat it up and cure it quickly. One last thing I should talk about glass ionomers and composites is glass ionomers give a chemical bond. They chelate and bond directly to the enamel and the dentin, whereas composites have no chemical bond at all. And they are a full mechanical bond. They lock in to the enamel and the dentin. Now, when a glass ionomer breaks down, it breaks down internally, but leaves the chemically bonded section to the outside. So even though they appear to have worn away, they are still effective and still bonding to the dentin and the enamel. Whereas a composite, when it breaks down, it breaks down at the margins and allows micro leakage. So using those two things together, we can talk about technologies in just a minute. So are and silver fillings bad for my kid or don't you have anything else? And I'll just quickly say there's never been a study that has shown silver fillings are bad for teeth and they've never shown that they have any adverse effects to the person in which they're placed. Very few people will show a mercury allergy and every time you remove an amalgam, even with high negative pressure, you're still gonna get a little picked up in gingival fluid and that a mercury is going to store in fat and it's going to stay in the body for six months. So just because you remove a malcolm doesn't mean you remove the mercury from the body. And while we're at it, let's talk a little bit about composites. Composites, as you know, we were seeing composites have no BPA, um, they're bis GMA, and there was that whole controversy in Europe about bis GMA versus BPA sealants. And the truth is, all bis, uh, the reason there's a controversy is BPA is an estrogen like compound that gets in the cells and acts like estrogen. And people were scared that their little boys were going to become little girls. Um, bis GMA was the response to that. And what it was, it's a larger molecule, so it doesn't get in the cell. And what was done was a BPA molecule had two equal molecules placed on either side of the core to make it bigger. So basically, every bis GMA molecule is a bis PA, a BPA molecule with additional things hanging out the sides. So whenever you use a bis GMA composite, there will always be a little BPA on the surface. Therefore, after you use the BPA, after you place the composite, you have to rinse it immediately to get rid of any loose BPA molecules that are around there. So before I get into anything about restoring, we have to talk about pain control because so many of you and I, for the longest time, misunderstood how important pain control was for any bit of restorative dentistry. It's necessary for successful treatment and poor pain control is sometimes the, the, is misinterpreted for disruptive behavior in kids. They can't sit still, they're unhappy, the hands to the face. And so let's just talk a little bit about pain control in kids. And the first thing you should do is always use topical and make it red. Why red? So it looks like blood. Remember that it numbs mucosa and not much deeper. Place it, leave it on for one to three minutes. The bad thing about it is it is an ester compound. Remember there are two different types? There is an ester and there is a, an amide. Topicals are all esters. Esters have good uptake through mucosa. The only problem is they also stop the red blood cells in the body, the hemoglobin, from carrying oxygen. Even transiently, great study out of Loma Linda showed that there was a transient hemoglobin, uh, uh, methemoglobinemia when topical was placed. So you want to avoid, if at all costs, using an ester or an ester amide in kids because it does decrease the amount. I don't know what that noise is in the background. It sounds like someone's listening to a baseball game. Anyway, so don't use too much. Thank you, whoever just turned that off. Um, don't use too much and make sure you're trying to use an amide only. Don't waste your money on anesthetics. I believe that everything can be done in kids using um, 
lidocaine, 2% lidocaine with epi, because it's not 4% septicaine, it causes less damage to the nerves, and you have a much wider margin of safety. Um, I can give you the exact same curve that you get from septicaine, and the exact same um, pickup, and from anesthetic to work time, using lidocaine as you can with septicaine. The difference of, between septicaine and lidocaine is lidocaine has something called a PKA, which is higher, which means when it's in the ionized and unionized form, it has to be at a higher pH, meaning somewhere in the neighborhood of 7.8, 8.4, somewhere around there, whereas tissue in the body is 7.4. So when the chemical, when the lidocaine hits that PKA, you have equal amounts of ionized and unionized, and only the ionized actually block the nerve. So there is a, mar a delay from when you inject from an acidic carpule, because all the carpules are acidic. They're at about a 3.8, and the reason for that is the um, preservative for um, lidocaine is acidic. You don't want the, epi I mean, the preservative for epinephrine is acidic. You don't want it to oxidize, because then it loses its effectiveness. So it takes a while to get from 3.8 to 7.4, and then to continue to make ionized molecules to block the nerve. Whereas the PK of septicaine is lower. It's closer to 7.4, 7.6, somewhere around there. So basically, that's why you have that latent period before the anesthetic hits after the injection, why the kids are so uncomfortable. Remember that for every block you do or every bit of local anesthesia you do, in order to block the nerve, you have to block three millimeters of the nerve, which is the same as three nodes of Ranvier. And so if you block three nodes of Ranvier, then you block the nerve conduction. The correct dosage is 4.4 for lidocaine and 4.4 for septicaine. I have 4.0 here, but the actual number is 4.0 milligrams per kilogram. And if you do the numbers, you look at Moore's rule of 25, which says for kids, for one, every 25 pounds of body weight, you can use only one carpule. Only one carpule. So as a nice rounded number, one carp for every 25 pounds of body weight will prevent you from overdosing the child. Factors contributing increased risk of local anesthesia overdose is not using epinephrine. There is no indication in kids for not using epinephrine. You can overdose if you use a standard amount. Many of you are still using a full carpule. Local anesthesia admitted, administered in four quadrants at once. Now, you can anesthetize an entire quadrant in a child under eight with less than one half carpule. I'll repeat that again, one half carpule. And you do not need to block children under the age of eight. Everything works by infiltration. This comes out of the Astra Pharmaceutical Package Insert from 1997, and they said even then, you need to let use less than one-half carpule from, for mandibular blocks or for anything. So if you're using more than a half carp in any quadrant, you're using way too much. Always use a short needle. Use a small amount because it diffuses over a wider area. And remember, you're trying to block three millimeters of, of nerve, and you want as few teeth and soft tissue as possible, meaning you you don't want the tongue numb. The technique is very simple. You go to the mesial of the tooth you're going to treat. You inject in that area parallel to the occlusal plane, just over the periosteum through the loose tissue, and while slowly injecting backwards past the distal of the last tooth that's going to close the clamp, hold the clamp, you inject less than half a carp. You then pull out and do an interpapillary injection where you come in from the buckle and slowly go through the papillae until you see blanching on the lingual. If you need any top-up, you just go ahead and do a little bit of infiltration on the lingual. But using less than half a carpule, you can do pulpotomies, pulpectomies, and extractions, and even mucogingival surgery. So never do a long buckle. And this will give you, using less than half a carpule, approximately one hour of anesthesia time. And here again is the technique. Now pH, as we said, most local anesthetics are weak bases, bases 7.5 to 9.5, and, and the pH of 
soft tissue is 7.4, only the base form can diffuse out of the nerve. So what you want to do is you want to see if you can get that pH up to 7.4 as quickly as possible. And how do you do that? You buffer. And so I'm going to give you a technique, which is if those of you that bought that really expensive kit that cost you $8 per cartridge, you just threw away your money. I'm really sorry. I'm going to show you a way to do it so it costs you approximately 20 cents a carpule, if that much. So basically, you get pain from the pH, acid burns, you get tissue in, um, injury in the latent uptake, and if you have an infected area, it's acidic. Infections are always acidic, so you can't reach that pH of 7.4. The benefits of buffering a local anesthetic is that it, it increases the amount of lipid-soluble active non-ionized form by 6,000 times. So at the moment you inject, you have 6,000 times more active anesthetic available. Decreased injury to tissue, and you, since you're using a sodium bicarbonate buffer, it releases carbon dioxide, which also acts as a local anesthetic. All you need is a 4.2 gram per 50 ml vial of sodium bicarbonate a tuberculin syringe, alcohol wipes, our standard local anesthetic carpule. And the technique is very simple. Let me start off and show this quickly. So here you have your tuberculin syringe. Your sodium bicarbonate, 4.2 grams per 50 ml. And here is your lidocaine carpule. So basically, you put your finger over the back of the stopper. You draw up in your tuberculin syringe. You, uh, you fill the tuberculin syringe, and I'm going to lower that a little bit if I can. You fill up your tuberculin syringe for the number of carpules you're going to fill. Each carpule gets one-tenth of an ml. You draw it up, and then you hold the syringe, or you hold the carpule, in your finger, holding, putting your finger, and I actually put it over the back, this one is not, and you inject one-tenth of an ml. The little rubber stopper comes out just a tiny bit, still fits easily in and is secure. You shake it and there is your buffered carpule. So that gives it to you so quickly, and when you inject it, you get almost immediate anesthesia. So time from inject in, injection to anesthesia is approximately a minute to a minute and a half. It works well. It doesn't prolong the local anesthetic. It actually shortens the amount of the time the local anesthetic is available because there's no more going back and forth between ionized and non-ionized. It's all ionized at the time it's injected. So it's an excellent technique less pain, faster onset, shorter duration. Complications, of course, are bit cheeks and lips, and no bit tongues because the tongue is not numb. And again, heals little scar. Other techniques that you should use for kids is using a rubber dam for all restorations. You're trying really hard to isolate the chin, I'm sorry, the lip, the cheek, and the, lip, the, cheek, and the tongue. Keep them out of the way. You can also use something, this is a Mr. Thirsty. There's also Isolite. There are all the different brands. There was a review by Christensen about all of them recently, and I still find that the rubber dam is the, most of it, is the best and the easiest to use. Simply made with two little holes, two holes, and then a slit cut between them. You pull the rubber dam over the quadrant, hold it in place with a little, um, some wooden wedges. Always use a mouth prop, nothing worse than a kid biting down or fighting with them. Tell them it's a tooth pillow and the tooth's going to sleep, so it needs a pillow like you at night. And of course, you use passive placement, but you must record it in your chart that you've used it. It is a form of behavior management. Don't extend for prevention. GV Black had it all wrong. 
with the new bonded restorations, we're able to remove less tooth. The one thing that we do have a problem with is because you have an, an outer layer of enamel, which is not organized as well as it is on permanent teeth, what we do is we make a little slot prep and then a slight prep onto the occlusal surface to increase bonding area. So we're trying to increase bonding area just slightly. You don't wipe out all the grooves. You just put it right there, a little hole, there's your little slot, and a little bit more. Use metal matrices, not plastic. Metal matrices don't cause an uncured layer next to them. So what I do is I get matrix rolls, I cut little bits to the size I need. I have shorts and longs. And then when I do my procedure, I just use the two I need, or the one or two, and I put a slight curve into it. If you want to do back-to-back -back and you have one of these old spot welders, you can spot weld one-third down, and that'll give you good proximal contact. Use two curing lights or an extremely fast one. There's no increased shrinkage if you use the very high lumen light. I use a 1200 or a 2000 lumen light, and it sets. The one thing you have to remember is you need 70% of the composite cured or the RMGI cured for full strength. And so since a curing light only shoots down four millimeters, every every class two prep in a kit takes four light cures. And the light has to be perpendicular to the prep, otherwise it pulls up on the other side because polymerization occurs towards the light. So it pulls up from the bottom. So always perpendicular. And my four, four cures are I do my occlusal, the box, then I do my occlusal surface, then I pull out the um, wedge, I do a buckle, and then I do a lingual. I pull out my wedge and my, my matrix bands, buckle and lingual. While I have you on the line, I'll tell you a little bit about bulk fill composites. They, there's no difference between a bulk fill and a regular composite other than they don't have radio opacity to them. And so they cure full distance. The more opaque a material is, the, the less it cures. So if you want to cure quickly, use a bulk fill composite, but you can't bulk it more than four millimeters, the total cure of the light itself. Other composite op chips, place global uh, material in the proximal box, and then immediately pack your composite into it, your filled composite, and that way you get all the interstices filled in and better adaptation. Use a burnisher, not a plugger, to decrease surface area. And we talked about opaque and whiter materials. And all I trim with is a 12 foot carbide burr, either a flame or a football or a barrel-shaped burr. And that's my entire trimming. And I use a gingival trimmer, an amalgam gingival trimmer, to trim interproximally. And when you have a pulpotomized tooth that you're going to restore, the most important thing is remember that most of the materials we use will uh, get stuck into the dentinal tubules and leave a residue. In order for any of our materials to bond, you need to go back in with a round burr, refresh the walls of the preparation over your pulp filling material, and then bond on top of that. And we'll see that in a minute. So if you end up having, by the way, you're doing a stainless steel crown versus a composite or a class two restoration. If it's an amalgam, you have to sadly do the composite for you do the class two first. In a composite, you do the stainless steel crown first and then build the margin up immediately. And that's because of the inherent weakness of amalgams as they set. Stainless steel crown rule number one, you always fit the tooth to the crown, not the crown to the tooth. So in other words, you learn the inside of the crown, look to see what the shape is, and then cut your tooth to um, the right size. Let's say you've lost a lot of space on a lower tooth. What's the best thing to do? If you've lost space, you pick the maxillary. So let's say you've lost space on the mandibular left side. You use the maxillary right corresponding stainless steel crown. So if you have space loss on D, which is the fourth tooth over, you pick the maxillary D on the other side. And that's one way to do it show you some more. So stainless steel crowns are many different brands out there. There's chromium and steel. There's nichrome ion. The difference is 
whether they're pre-trimmed or not pre-trimmed, whether they must be contoured and crimped, and the stainless steel crowns are always stronger than the nichrome, but the nichrome, the nickel chromium crowns, are more flexible and will get over um, the bulges a little bit better. So let's look at some anterior aesthetic restorations. And basically, here's some of the options. We have composites. We have stainless steel crowns, stainless steel crowns with composite windows, stainless steel crowns powder coated in white, which were terrible and never worked, bonded acrylic or composite, which the material um, cracks off, stainless steel crown or pita form full coverage composite crowns, preform composite crowns, silicate composite crowns, and finally the ceramic crowns that so many companies are now making, including New Smile, Easy Pito, and being tested by a number of other companies. So stainless steel crowns with composite windows, again, if you have to go subgingival and you want to save a tooth, do a stainless steel crown. It's going to go below the gums. It mar it's marginal adaptation is fair, not great, but if you need some strength, and then if you want it aesthetic, you use a 330 burr, and you go in and you cut this out, cut the window out, and then bond and pack with composite. Make sure the cement you use is usually a glass atom or cement, so you get additional bonding. Here are the resin bonded stainless steel crowns. The problem with these is the crown flexes but the material that's bonded to the crown does not flex. So as you seat it down, if there's any tension, you will crack the face off. Now here, Kinder Crowns actually has a molar crown with a composite face, with a um, bonded acrylic facing. But again, you put these, they wear very quickly and they do have a tendency to crack. But you also need, because you have to make sure that your crown fits over the tooth, you have to do a lot more prep production. And here's a couple that I did, and you can see on three of them, I think the aesthetics are fairly good. The kid looks really good, and the gingiva has healed really well. Zirconium pre-sized crowns, and again, we talked about a couple of brands that make them. The big issue here is, number one, you have to reduce a lot of tooth structure. Number two, they can't be in occlusion. And number three, you can't have any blood on the field. And any deposit, anything deposits on there or inside the crown, you won't get any bonding. And you cement these, of course, with the glass ionomer. But the trick is you have to get the prep really clean for these to bond because there's no mechanical retention. It's all chemical retention. So there's no mechanical retention. So basically saying that, what you have to do is you have to clean the tooth off. And some of the things that have been recommended include acetone to wipe down the tooth before you go ahead and place the zirconium crown and cement it. You also make sure there's no bleeding from the gingiva as you cement the crown until the material sets. So they're good, they're very aesthetic, but they have some um, problems. Composite strip crowns are extremely useful, and um, Space Maintainers Labs makes these, and basically they're a celluloid crown former that you place over, you fill with composite and place it over the prep that you've made. You need a certain bulk of material, and in order for them to have any longevity, you have to make a little chamfer base. So in other words, you make a chamfer at the gingival margin, and then you put the crown over that, and when you trim back, you trim back to that chamfer for strength. So here again is that one in the molar. So here's a case that I'll just go through quickly. Here's a decay. It was into the pulp. It's all, um, I isolate each tooth using a rubber dam, separate holes, and I tie floss around them. I then measure my crown former, cut it and trim it so that it fits. I now cut my prep. And again, I go down and I cut a chamfer just above the gingiva, just above the floss that's holding the dam in place. I remove my caries. I fit my crown formers on and I put them all on at the same time to make sure they go subgingival and below that prep line that I finished. Here they are, all cut and ready. Next thing I do is I make a little hole on the lingual and that acts as a little vent. And here you can see the vent holes on the linguals of all of these preps and see how nicely organized they are? I, I are, I am. And here I'm filling them with a composite. In this case, I used APH and I used TPH. It's a filled composite, but it's 
fairly flowable. And then I do take a flowable to act as a lubricant, and I place it right in the access area. I then smush it around using a black plastic instrument, and here they sit. This is what my assistant did, lined them up like this, and I had to figure out which one went where before I started, because you don't have much time. So now my preps are clean. I've done my pulpotomy on this tooth. I'm placing glass ionomer into the deeper recesses so that it flows well. I'm curing in my, my resin-modified glass ionomer. I now etch everything. I place my bonding agent. And now I've cured it, and I, pat, I push down my two crown formers. And you can see the material extruding out the lingual. Here are the four in place. I've light cured them. Now I use my, um, gin, my amalgam carver, which I, had n I never realized I could use, my interproximal carver. I remove my crown formers. I then trim, and here's the result I got. And this was done under local with a little laughing gas, no GA. And I think those are rather aesthetic. And here are a couple of cases that I did doing that same technique. Here's the fracture, the discolored tooth, the pulpotomy. And here are the buildups of the two fractured anterior teeth. And I think, again, they look reasonably good. An extraction alternative, let's say you have no choice, but an anterior tooth has to come out, and you can't restore it using either a stainless steel crown or any of the other techniques, then consider an extraction. And let's say the parents are... Um, want something cosmetic, what you can do is you can build, and this is available from Space Maintainer's Lab, it's called a Gerber appliance or a pedo bridge. Uh, not a, a Gerber, a Groper appliance, G-R-O-P-E-R. And basically it's like a lower lingual holding arch, except in the maxillary arch, we bill it out as a space maintainer, though we'd not, we know we don't really need space maintainers. And then these teeth are fabricated using composite or acrylic. And here's one that we put in place, and if you can't tell where it is, Look for the cleft line. This child had a cleft palate, and we made this one using a little pink acrylic to fill in the defect and the tooth, and the girl was extremely happy with this. Cement these in using your ortho cement. Now, another little thing you should understand is what happens when you have a primary tooth next to a permanent tooth, and you have decay on the distal of the primary tooth abutting the permanent tooth. There's usually a white spot lesion on the permanent tooth right next to it. Well, you want to get some of the benefits of a glass anomer, which is fluoride release. As you remember, glass anomers can also be recharged with fluoride. They release fluoride quickly. So you want to place a fluoride-releasing agent right next to the tooth. So in this case, what I recommend you do is I fill the proximal box either with a resin modified glass ionomer which, re which releases fluoride or a glass ionomer. But they have poor wear resistance. Remember I said they wear and they break internally? So then you go ahead on the occlusal surface, you fill it with composite. So in other words, it's two different layers, but your sandwich is actually externalized working on and releasing fluoride to remineralize the white spot lesion on the tooth next to it. And what about sealants? I'm going to spend two seconds about sealants. You all got that thing in the ADA newsletter today that said that sealants are extremely effective in preventing caries. Now, I think I have another message from telling me to slow down, or I'm still breaking up. Let me see what that message says. Nope. Okay. Caries in primary teeth form between the teeth. Caries in permanent teeth occur on the occlusal surface, and they're because of mineralization defects and other problems. So they're also not cleansable. So you get fissure morphology. Remember, the way a tooth forms is it's five sections that fuse together, and that space between the fused sections is a weak spot. So you get caries. So I use sealants on molars and premolars in both primary and permanent teeth. I use the linguals of the anteriors, and I put them on geminated or fused teeth because there's always a weak spot right in that groove. So there are a bunch of different sealing systems available, resin-bonded systems, or using a um, flowable composite over a bond. You bond first, then you place flowable composite for strength. 
Um, or there are glass ionomer systems, which for the longest time I always said were terrible and I didn't recommend them, until I saw a bit of research that came out recently. And here it is. This came out in 2012. And looking at the numbers, it showed that you have a higher retention rate in resin seals, composite sealants, if you groove, but at two years you have a 32% loss, which means they re need to be redone. A glass ionomer seal has a higher retention rate without grooving, and that makes sense because you're getting the chemical bond directly to the enamel, to the hydroxyapatite. It chelates with the calcium but you have a 60% clinical loss at two years. Now, when we say clinical loss, it means you're looking at the tooth and you can't find the sealant. But if you look at the caries rates at two years, if you have resin sealant, resin there, you, with grooving, you have 16%. Without grooving, you have a 12% recurrent rate of caries. So why is it so high? Because where did I say the break always occurs? at the bonding site. So a few resin tags are left in there, but in general, the whole thing fails at the site. But with glass ionomers, with grooving, you get 4% recurrent caries, and without grooving, 8% recurrent caries. Why do you think this is? Well, if you groove the tooth, then you clean up the enamel and remove the fluoridated layer, and you have more exposed calcium hydroxide, uh, more exposed calcium for the chelation. And so you only get this because, remember, I said the fracture is not at the margin. So the groove is still sealed with a microscopic level of glass ionomer sealant without grooving 8%. So this shows you that glass ionomer sealants are useful because they can also be placed in mildly wet environments, especially on primary teeth. I hear some noise in the background. I hope it's okay. Sealants fail because of overetching. If you overetch, you, you etch farther than the resin can bond down into and lock into, and so you have a weak spot below it. Decay left in the grooves. The ADA says you can seal teeth that have enamel caries, not dentin caries, but enamel caries, but it's hard to know unless you groove the area and find out. Moisture and other contaminants, air bubbles in pockets, and dislodgement from occlusion. And, of course, no ion transfer prevents remineralization. So let's quickly look at pulpary in about five to ten minutes and see if we can get some things straightened out here. Again, pulp therapy saves so many primary teeth. Primary teeth are important for space maintenance. Natural space maintenance is always better than artificial space maintenance because it maintains the alveolar bone that we talked about in the very beginning. So you have a bunch of different options. And again, based on the tooth, if the tooth is totally non-vital versus infected but vital, and vital and non-symptomatic. Now let me tell you a secret. There's no such thing, and I know you all learned this in dental school, another myth is that you can only have an infected pulp, an infected coronal pulp, and you scoop it out and you make all things better. That is so bogus. The infection spreads, the bacteria is spreading all through the roots all into the canals, and the bacteria are there. All you're looking for, and the only thing that we have that's a predictable source of information, is whether we can get hemostasis, because if a pulp is so infected and so inflamed, it's going to continue to bleed throughout. The reason formacreosol worked so well is because it fixed everything. It killed the bacteria. It killed everything because it was an, a fixative agent. Um, it was an antibacterial agent. And you know what else? It's a carcinogen, and it leached through the pulp chambers and through the floor of the tooth into the surrounding alveolar bone and into the forming tooth butt below. We knew that back in the early 90s. A number of studies were published about that. But yet it continues to be used. We've tried diluting it. We've tried a whole bunch of things. But it still works by the same mechanism. It stops all metabolism, therefore sterilizes. But in this time, it's really difficult to say to a parent, I'm just going to put this carcinogen in this kid's tooth, and don't worry, it'll fall out in five, six years. We'll only leave a little bit of the former creosol in the surrounding tooth and the surrounding. You can't say that. So we've had to look for alternatives. So these are the types of pulp therapy you can do in primary teeth, caries control, pulpotomy, pulpectomy, and extraction. Partial pulpectomies do not exist. If you need to do a partial pulpectomy, just do a pulpectomy. 
So carries control, we talked about it's the IRT, ITR. It's also indirect pulp capping. It's where you place a biomimetic material, a material which releases calcium in the area, makes the environment basic because in basic environment, the um, blastic cells are formed, not the clastic. Clastic means to tear down. Blastic means to grow up. And so all cells form, all tissues form in a, cl a blastic environment, in a basic environment. Remember we said gum tissue, all tissues are 7.4. That's the kind of pH you need. So putting calcium hydroxide over a tooth or around the area will stimulate the growth and the conversion into, clastic t into blastic tissues from clastic tissues. One thing I will say, by the way, is pulps do not like, do not like bis-GMA. It actually causes inflammation and inflammatory destruction. So if you place calcium hydroxide with bis-GMA, such as um, the liner material that's light cured, that has bis-GMA in it. That's going to damage the pulp. So you can't place that directly on a pulp, and you need a fair amount of distance between the pulp, at least two millimeters between the pulp and that material. If you get closer to the pulp, you can place glass ionomers, because glass ionomers do the miracle thing of causing the clastic cells to form. So for caries control, these are the factors that you need. Remember the pulp chamber and primary teeth is always directly in the middle. Don't go searching like in a permanent teeth. Make a hole directly down through the center groove. Find the pulp and work outwards from there to remove the entire roof of the pulp chamber. So in a caries control or IPC, indirect pulp cap, partial removal, place calcium hydroxide, IRM. IRM works because of what? Because it is what? It's zinc oxide and eugenol. So it is a hydrophilic agent, so it reduces inflammation in the pulp. And Theracal is something you should not be using because if you place it near the pulp, it will cause infl inflammation. And then what happens if you happen to expose the pulp? Well, in the old days, we used to say this was definitely going to be a pulpotomy. But sometimes if you accidentally expose it in a sterile area, you can try using MTA, and we'll talk about about that in a minute. Pulpotomy, you're removing, there's active decay, the pulp may be sensitive, the tooth may be bothersome. Infected coronal pulp, and again, there's no such thing as just an infected coronal pulp. Everything is infected, so you open up the tooth, you get it clean. So what can you use? What medicaments can you use for pulpotomies? You can use Vitapex. Vitapex is calcium hydroxide. Again, we get the stimulation of the clastic cells, silicone oil, and iodophore paste, which is a mild antibiotic. This is easily resorbable, and it sterilizes the area after you do the treatment. Now, many of you heard about the Anaheim and the Atlanta problems, and the question is, were those done with ferric sulfate? Ferric sulfate pulpotomy is, though, acceptable. Ferric iron happens to be one of the food sources for mycobacterium. And so one of the hypotheses that's brought forth is that these were ferric sulfate pulpotomies in a non-clean water system and that allowed the mycobacterium to grow and cause the cellulitis and the infections in the children. But anyway, this is an antibiotic. It cleans and it does. And actually in a study in International Journal of Pediatric Dentistry, it says Vitapex is better than zinc oxide. MTA, many of you know about, and um, there are a bunch of different MTAs on the market. It is basically Portland cement, and it is extremely basic, and it causes very little reaction formation on the pulp, and it lays down, it causes laying down of secondary dentin. It's used in permanent and primary teeth. It is non-restorable, so it cannot go, non-resorbable, so it cannot go in the canals. It has strength equal to IRM, and it seals better than amalgam and it sterilizes the area. And there are a bunch of different brands. There's Pro Root by Dent Supply Tulsa, which is the standard MTA, which is a bunch of different calcium cements, silicate cements. The problem with this is that it causes discoloration. Tricalcium silicate has the same effect. It is approved for the use in pulpotomies, and it's available in capsules from Biodentine or it's also available from a number of companies as NeoMTA, and I know that SML is looking at selling NeoMTA. 
Biodentine comes in premixed capsules. You have to, they're not premixed, you have to add water. And then trituratum, um, Neo MTA, NEO dash MTA, um, is mixed powder liquid. Never use a metal spatula because it will take the metal, the metal right off it and always mix it on a paper pad. Achieving hemostasis, in order to get hemostasis and prove that there is no, um, no inflammation that's remaining or, or that there are inflammations under control, the best way is always slightly moist cotton pellet, cotton pellet dipped in fibrin, electrosurgery or electrofulguration, which was uh, Ron Mack from an AV who remember who's passed away, he was a big proponent of electrofulguration. Uh, an astringent, and here's the ferric sulfate, which is astringent, and we talked a little bit about that. Ferric chloride or aluminum chloride, and I personally use aluminum chloride um, in a gel to stop my bleeding. And I get hemostasis, I rinse it out, and sometimes you need to irrigate, you should wash and irrigate the canal because there's still bacteria all over. You can use sodium hypochlorite, you can use chlorhexidine, EDTA does not sterilize, it has no antibacterial effect. So again, pulpotomy, place whatever medicament, and then go ahead and place, you should have a base of the floor that looks like that, and place your material. And here we have Internal resorption, is this a failure or a success? Internal resorption is success because you're still maintaining the space. Here we have an abscess. We have much bone loss. Is this a failure or a success? Obviously a failure. And as long as this isn't affected, I'm going to show you about retreating these and how to do it. Partial pulpectomy doesn't exist, so we'll skip it. Let's go to pulpectomy. So you have a necrotic pulp such as this tooth, and basically you go into the canals, instrument to 40, irrigate with sodium hypochlorite, dry it out, and place Vitapex down into the canals. This slide is six months after this slide, and you can see how much bone fill I've gotten and the healing of the area. I went in through the fistulous tract, scooped out the, the granulation tissue, and a lot of times I actually try to get the Vitapex to extrude through the apex to fill the area. And this is the kind of healing you can get. Fill the canals with zinc oxide neutral or Vitapex. I like Vitapex because it is antibacterial. And here's an anterior tooth which I've instrumented to 80. So my anteriors are 80 and my um, posteriors are 40. Here's another case and this is very resorbable, and you can see I've extruded a little bit out, and you can see that the healing is already going on in the furcal area. And these have been sealed with and restored with stainless steel crowns. Here's one which I restored with a composite. And here I built my class two composite first, then went back in through my composite, opened up the pulp chamber, did my Vitapex pulpectomy, and then went ahead and resealed with glass ionomer, which is right over here, this is all glass ionomer, covered with a composite. And this is an extremely durable, strong, and space-maintaining restoration. Here's another one. This was a deep cavity that I filled. I must have nicked the pulp, uh, the pulp horn. I went back in, and this is three months later. I re redid the composite. Here's a glass ionomer. Here it's extruded out, it's resorbing, but look at the bone fill and the healing that's going on. So pulpectomies do work in children. They don't take very long. And so we talked about restoring, but my point to you again here is that always go back in and use a round burr and clean the walls of the chamber between your layers. So after you put your MTA into the canal and tamp it down, Take a round burr, clean it around, and then place your glass ionomer on top of it. And here we have a glass ionomer placed on top, tamped down, light cured, and then again a round burr, cleaning it out so you can go ahead and bond in your composite. Stainless steel crowns, your preps, everyone knows, you remove a millimeter and a half on the buckle and the lingual. I'm sorry, a millimeter and a half on the mesial and the distal and a cleaning all the way down to the bulge 
just below the gingiva on the buccal and lingual. You must reduce the buccal and lingual to get a good fitting prep. And here we go. I use stainless, I use wedges to move the gingiva out of the way. And then I, I crimp even my pre-crimped crowns. I hold them in the very tip of the belling plier and I bend them down and round them out. You can also use a crimper. I actually like using a belling plier. And if you can't get a crown to fit and you've tried the maxillary right for mandibular left, maxillary left for mandibular right, turn your belling plier inside out and give it a good crimp like that and push in that side. You should get it to fit. There's also extraction. Critical may require space maintenance, non-critical means you don't need to do it, and it's optional for cosmetics. And this was done the time I did the procedure. I got hemostasis, and I cemented a Gerber band and loop space maintainer, again, made by Space Maintainer Labs, and it was inserted at the time of the procedure after I got hemostasis, cemented with Duralon cement. Different types. These are lab fabricated and band and loop. You know what? Someone somewhere told us that band and loops were important. We were told we needed a loop, but in truth, we have no need for a loop. You can do something called a one-arm bandit, which allows space for the new tooth to erupt without having to take this out. And so basically, you fit an 036 wire. You spot weld it onto a band or onto a crown, put a little solder, extend it a long distance, and what you do is you mark it with a pencil, bend it back with a three-pronged plier, make it fit, and then cement it in place. And here's a Gerber that I've just fit in. I haven't bent it yet. I haven't cemented it yet, but I've measured the distance. And now what I do is I put a three-pronged plier on the top and give it a curve to come up. And this is done at the time that the kid's sitting in the chair. This is done. This has to be lab processed. And for the maxilla, maxilla you don't need unilateral, you, you basically, if you have two teeth against each other because they rotate in opposite directions, you don't get closure. Closure of spaces in the mandibular arch is because the teeth tip forward. In the maxillary arch, they rotate to close the space. And so if you can prevent the rotation, then you don't close, then the space won't close. So in the maxilla, you can use something called the transpalatal arch, which holds this tooth from rotating into the place. Nance appliances really have very little value because there's no reason to do this little big piece or this big piece of acrylic. A transpalatal arch keeps the space. So if you have a space where you can place a single band and loop, go ahead on the maxilla. If there's a double space, try a one-armed bandit. If it's not working, then go ahead and use a transpalatal arch to keep this space open. Kids do really well with this. And distal shoes, I hate. I have always hated them. And I try to save every tooth I can except something that looks like this. And in this case, I had no choice. And you know how these work. You take pictures. You figure out where you are here. You went right into the forming tooth bud. You can see the spot right there. Thankfully, it healed. Here it is touching the mesial. I now no longer do this. I use, and these can be done with a Gerber appliance. They have these attachments. But what I do is I sever the bottom. And I put a little acrylic over this, and I push it down, hold it in place, so that I have a pressure appliance as opposed to one that cuts into the tissue. And so you take your Gerber with your distal shoe attachment, cut the blade off, and cover it with acrylic so it doesn't hurt the child. And so parent wishes, extraction is alternative restorative care, exfoliation, how much money the parent has or if the parent that wishes not to do treatment. What's your success rate of a, pulp a pulpectomy done well? Between 90 and 95 percent. A pulpotomy done well? Between 90 and 95 percent. So ectopic eruption, we're going to skip this, but these are other appliances you can use. Most of us recommend now allowing this to about 50 percent of these auto erupt correctly. So if they don't, then you allow this tooth, the second molar to exfoliate, second primary molar to exfoliate, and then you go ahead and you distalize it. You can distalize it using a bunch of different appliances. There's a Halterman appliance. You'll see that in the Space Maintainer's website, and it's actually a little hook that goes behind. You fit a little ortho bracket here with a rubber band, and it pulls it distally. This was a spontaneous correction. This straightened out by itself. This one I used a ligature wire to move the tooth backwards. And basically, I'm 
here's distillation appliances you can use, or you can use a removable appliance. Again, these are all in the Space Maintainers catalog. Now, one bonus question before we take questions is, what do you do in this case? Do you extract this tooth? Oh, I see some hands going up. How many of you say extract? How many of you say don't extract? The don't extractors are absolutely right. This, because this tooth came in lingually, doesn't mean there's a space problem. The teeth form in a bowl back over here, and they shoot up through the path of least resistance. And you see this thing over here that I'm pointing to, the tongue? That's stronger than all orthodontic appliances. And that will move this tooth into place. No matter what you do, if you take this out early or not, this tongue is going to move this into wherever it's going to go, whether there's space or not. So I don't recommend you take baby teeth out in the lower anteriors. And what about this case? Well, actually, if you look at it, there seems to be probably enough space. But this is a case where there's extremes of crowding. And so if you're looking at an extreme of crowding, then perhaps you want to get an orthodontic consult. But this may actually work out without anything and just leave it alone, allowing this to push these out and telling the kid to wiggle. So one final question for que before I take your questions is what does the tooth fairy do with all those teeth he or she takes? It's a good question. I want you to think about that tonight. And I'm going to reveal the secret of successful pediatric dentistry right now. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Pay attention because you won't see it again. Good ear plugs. I wear ear plugs to prevent that screeching that's as if I'm standing behind the jet engine of a 747. I happen to use this brand, Edematics, but you can use the swimming ear plugs and they work just as well. We have them in the rooms because, as you know, because of OSHA, we're responsible for hearing of our staff. And with that, my final thing. Thank you for listening. As Barack Obama said, it took a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get to where we are today, but we've just begun. Today we begin in earnest the work of making sure that the world we leave our children is just a little bit better than the one we inhabit today. Thank you for treating kids, and thank you for listening in tonight. Enjoy yourself with what you do. You are the kings. And any questions? I am 